Encapsulation is one of the most important concepts in networking. Its actions are driven by the concepts behind the layers in the TCP IP model. In this video, we'll talk about the key concepts and terminology. So where are we headed with this video? Well, first we'll talk about encapsulation, unsurprisingly, and the related terms. And then we'll talk about the network messages themselves, depending on what headers are or are not included, and some related terms, so a lot of terminology to go along with the concepts. And we'll cap it off talking about the OSI model and how it relates to TCP IP because most of the relationships have to do with encapsulation. Also, if you've got the books and you're following along there, this content matches the second of two sections in Volume 1, Chapter 1. As usual, stick around to the end of the video. I'll have a short section about the CCNA study group concept where I give you coaching on what to focus on after the video. So I'll tell you where to focus your review. I'll point out the tools here at the Network Up Skill channel as well as the tools over in the books. All right, let's jump in and talk about encapsulation. So encapsulation and the related concept called de-encapsulation are straightforward, but they're hugely important. So let's think about, say, host A, where we got a client app and it's connecting to some server app over on the right. And here's a reminder of the five layers of the TCP IP model on the bottom left. So that app is running and it's going to create some data that it wants to send over to the server. So there's the data. Then the app is going to place that data in front of an application layer header. So anytime the logic for some layer places a header in front of some already created data, that's called encapsulation. Uh, by analogy, it's kind of like, hey, I'm going to put a letter in an envelope to mail it. Well, I'm, I'm putting this data inside the application layer header or just beside it so I can process it and send it on its way. But this happens at multiple steps. So the application layer's logic says, hey, I can't send this through the network. That's not one of my functions, but I can ask my next lower layer protocol to do that. So say the app is using TCP, so it asks TCP to do its job. And part of that job is encapsulating the data handed off by the application layer behind a TCP header. And then when TCP on host A is done with its processing. It thinks, hey, I need some help to get this data to where it needs to go. I'm going to ask the next lower layer for help, the network layer, which implements IP. And part of its job is to encapsulate this data behind an IP header. Then when IP is done building that, it says, hey, I can't send this. I need a data link protocol. Let's just say PCA is connected to an Ethernet. Well, it adds an Ethernet header and it turns out data link protocols typically have both a header and trailer. And by the way, header, which I didn't define yet, is just some bits and bytes defined by the protocol for the purpose of encapsulating data with some information in there that's useful to that protocol. Like the IP header has IP addresses in it, for instance. So here's the Ethernet header, and also because it's a data link protocol, an Ethernet trailer. And these are the combined bits, the data, the original data from the app, but all these additional overhead headers and trailers that needs to be transmitted. So then the data link layer asks the physical layer, hey, how about sending those bits for me? And they're sent into the network. Then they'll eventually arrive over at the server. So imagine the bits are just arriving. The physical layer will process those and think, all right, this is a string of ones and zeros, right? It's binary code at that point instead of electricity. And so the physical layer is going to say, hey, I'm going to complete processing the physical activity and give this data off to the data link layer. And the data link layer, it's going to do its processing based on information in the data link layer header and trailer. And when the data link layer is done processing, it's going to throw that trailer and header away. So that's called de-encapsulation, removing the headers and trailers when you're processing the data upon receipt. Hands the information off to the network layer or IP, does its work, strips off the IP header, hands it off to the transport layer code, in this case TCP, it does its work, strips off the TCP header. The application layer code does its work, strips off the application header, and you're left with the data. So there's de-encapsulation. 
Next, I want to introduce you to a couple of other related terms that maybe aren't very often used anymore, but just in case, I want to introduce them. So I'm going to repeat those same flows with encapsulation and de-encapsulation, the same exact example, and introduce the topic, all right, the term. So the app here on host A creates some data, adds that application layer header, and when the application layer code says, hey, I want to ask the transport layer to do its job, it's it's doing logic like this. Hey, here's my data, TCP. Please process it and encapsulate it. And that's a case where one layer, the app layer, is interacting with the transport layer. And there's an old term for that called adjacent layer interaction. So on that one computer, thinking about this in terms of the TCP IP model, it's two adjacent layers interacting with each other. So hence the term there. I've introduced it to you. And just to walk through it again, so TCP does its work. It's going to ask the network layer or IP for some help. So it's interaction between the transport and network layer, another case of adjacent layer interaction. All right, so that's all the term refers to. And I'm just going to click through the example and get over to where the data is received over at the server app. And it's the same kind of thing. Remember how we got the bits arriving and the physical layer processed those. And it said, hey, I've received these bits. Please process data link layer. Well, that's the physical and data link layers adjacent to each other in the model interacting. So the term adjacent layer interaction, when the data link layer gets done processing and discards the data link header and trailer, it's ready to ask the network layer IP to do its work. Another case of adjacent layer interaction. Now there's a separate different term. There we go called same layer interaction. And that's just a term that refers to the concept of communicating on the opposite host, the two hosts. So you've got your client app and your server. Now, for instance, think about the IP header at the network layer that defines IP addresses. When A sends its data, there's an IP header and there's a destination IP address that is the server's IP address. So it's the network layer code here at host A that's added that header with the destination address of 10123. And then when the message flows across the network and arrives over here at the server, it's the network layer code at the server that's gonna process that IP header to decide, hey, is this packet for me? So there's this idea of, hey, the network layer here is trying to send the packet to that address, and the network layer at the receiver is thinking, hey, that's sent to me, I should process this message. Same layer, network layer and network layer. So that's just a reference to this concept that, hey, IP on both hosts will communicate to each other using the IP header. TCP on the opposite host will use the TCP header, et cetera, et cetera. Next, let's talk about the network messages in various states of encapsulation and de-encapsulation. For reference, here's the TCP IP model as a reminder. So imagine you've got an app running, it builds some data, the app adds an application layer header, it adds a transport layer header like a TCP header, and it turns out if you're having a conversation and you're wanting to talk about that message and you want to ignore any prior header or later trailer, that's just what you want to talk about, that you'll refer to that as a segment. Later, if you're having a conversation and what you want to talk about is the message that includes the IP header but you don't care about the data link header and trailer, then we'll call that a packet in conversation and in when you write things. And then similarly, if we do care about the data link header and trailer and want to talk about those in conversation, we'll call that a frame. All right. So those are conventions you'll see around Cisco land, but just be aware, not everyone dogmatically follows the use of terms like this. This is just the most common terms and the most frequently used terms to describe these messages in their different states. Now let's just say we're talking about a TCP segment like this. Oftentimes that also means we really only care about the TCP header. That, that's where the conversation is. So you don't really care about the detail over here, or if you're talking about an IP packet, you don't really care about the TCP and app header so much. So what you'll see represented more often in those cases, if you're talking about the TCP segment, it's just the TCP header and data. And you and I would then know, well, there's actually more detail, but we don't care. Or the IP packet, the IP header and data, 
We know there's more detail over here. We just don't care right now, and so on. Here's an, here's an Ethernet frame or any data link frame. There's the header and trailer and data. More detail hidden there. We don't care. All right, so that's the gist of it. There are three alternate terms you can be aware of, less important to memorize, but there's a generic term called protocol data unit instead of segment, packet, and frame. And because the layers in the TCP IP model, you can think of them as numbered one, two, three, and four. Well, two, three, and four. Here's the data link layer entity. It's a layer two PDU. The layer three entity, it's a layer three PDU and layer four PDU, as you see there. So just to sum up the terms, we could say these messages are TCP segment, IP packet, or data link frame, or just call them for shorthand L4 PDU, L3 PDU, and L2 PDU. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, great. I think you'd enjoy the books as well. So if you don't have the books yet, if you'll click that link and buy them there, then I'll get a few dollars back from the bookseller as an affiliate marketing commission. It's no extra cost to you, and it's a great way to support the channel. It's always appreciated. Thanks for that. But hey, let's get back to TCP IP and encapsulation and talk about the OSI model. So let's talk about the history of networking for a moment. Way back, say, 1970, early 1970s. If you wanted to do networking, you bought networking from a particular vendor, and it used protocols from that vendor, all right? There wasn't TCP IP you could use. But around that time, movements started happening to have a vendor-independent way to do networking because it used to be if you bought IBM stuff and did IBM networking, you were locked into IBM, or if you bought from DEC or any of the other computer companies of that era. So there in the 1970s and even into the 1980s, there was TCP IP under research, mostly in universities and in the Defense Department in the U.S., and then there was OSI research as well. So OSI was basically a competitive networking model with the idea that one of these, or maybe both, but we need something that's independent from the vendor so that one day, it doesn't matter what vendor you buy your computers from, everybody would run some vendor-independent network model. And that's where we've landed today, many decades ago, as it turns out. So by the early 1990s, there were TCP IP and OSI products that were really far enough along to be reasonable to use inside real companies, all right? So people started thinking, all right, I can get rid of my lock-in with all these vendors and move to one of these, and TCP IP won. It, it didn't take too many years. OSI didn't, so you don't run computers with OSI today. You run computers with TCPI in them. So by the late 1990s, there was this mass migration from all these companies from their vendor proprietary models over to use TCPIP. However, there are some vestiges of OSI that we still see cropping up today. So OSI was a networking model. It had seven layers instead of the five we see in TCPIP today. And the bottom four layers versus the model we use today with TCP IP, they're even the same names. They defined the same general things. The details were much different, all right? But, you know, network layer, hey, a logical addressing structure that's not tied to the physical network or transport, a way to identify applications running on a computer, that kind of thing. But in OSI, there were three layers with lots more detail of what you might want to do on the endpoint, whereas with TCPIP, it's one application layer. So you can think of the TCPIP application layer as being the closest approximation of what OSI defined at its top three layers. But these bottom four layers as pretty much matching up in terms of big ideas. Now, that doesn't matter a lot today other than to talk about the related terminology, all right? So here's the deal. OSI is a seven-layer model, and the layers were numbered, one through seven, from the bottom to the top. So today, we have a five-layer TCP IP model, so you'd think, well, maybe we'd number those layers, one through five, and we don't. Literally, you go out in industry, and you read things, and it's layers one, two, three, four, and oh, that's layer seven. The application layer is layer seven. Why? Because OSI application layer is seven. So even though you wouldn't have run OSI for the last 20 plus years, there's still this tendency to refer to the TCP IP application layers, layer seven. So I'm just making you aware of that for when you bump into it. 
So it might be useful, too, to memorize the names of the layers of the OSI model. I don't think it's a big deal today. It's certainly not mentioned in the CCNA blueprint. It was in the past. It's not anymore. But if you did want to memorize it, you could just brute force memorize the name of the layers. Notice four at the bottom and the top layer, they're the same names as the TCP IP model. But here are a few OSI mnemonics that might help. So please do not take sausage pizza away. The first letters are the same as the names of the layers. Or going top to bottom, all people seem to need data processing. Again, the first letters match up to the OSI model. And if you're thinking, I'm already having a hard time memorizing the TCP IP model. Well, if you use these mnemonics, it helps you with the TCP IP model because, of course, the TCP IP model uses the same terms as OSI model, except it doesn't have that presentation and session layer. So let me give you a few words of study advice as you go away from this video. For data encapsulation terminology, the encapsulation and de-encapsulation concepts are hugely important. You're going to see them over and over, but those are the stars of the show here. Memorizing those three words for the messages for those different layers, that's important. OSI model and TCP IP model is less important. You'll probably memorize the TCP IP model as a side effect of just studying for CCNA. For review, I'd say give some spacing, maybe a couple of days, and do the terminology mind map that covers all three videos about the TCP IP model, those that correspond to Volume 1, Chapter 1 in the book. The seed term, unsurprisingly, is TCP IP, and there's a video about what terminology mind maps are if you're unsure as to what those are, but it's a great tool to exercise your brain and make it use retrieval practice, which is the most effective way to exercise your memory. We are at the end of a chapter as compared to the book, so it's always good to read the section of the chapter, but because we're at the chapter end, look at the chapter review, and by the way, some things you'll find, find there in the book. If you look there, it says review all the key topics from the chapter. That's always a good thing to do. Use interactive flashcards for key terms from the chapter, and also there's some chapter opening questions. You can repeat those as part of your review. Again, I give it a little bit of spacing maybe two, three days before you go off and do that chapter review. Or maybe you just don't want to review. You want to learn something new right now? Well, click on that video on the left, and that'll move you on to the next video in sequence, which is about Ethernet fundamentals. But if you're ready for that terminology mind map, the one on the right, that's the one that has the review of a terminology mind map. Hey, thanks for hanging out. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you soon.